What, what's your thoughts about this? Is this a, a good strategy to try to improve America's uh, economic and financial footing vis-a-vis -vis its you know, main rival? Um, could Frenchoring have a, a benefit? Uh, is it realistic to support American industries and interests in, you know, well, near abroad? I mean, first of all, if the goal of the trade war was to reduce the trade deficit with China, we lost. The income tax was supposed to fall on the very rich. The Rockefellers, the Carnegies, right? Those guys, the, the, the billionaire uh, of their time. And if we had the income tax, the public was told, we can eliminate the tariffs, right? And everybody knew back then that tariffs were taxes on the middle class and the poor. This is The Global Gambit. So the United States, the global economic power, the hegemon, international markets here at The Global Gambit, that's what we like to focus on, the nexus of geopolitical risk and global macro, but also reconsider, reimagine uh, the West's place in this uh, multipolar world and sort of maybe push back against the sense that uh, the US is in internal decline and the BRICS or something like that is the uh, the new standard bearer of, uh, of leadership and everything like that. Uh, things are changing, but how much? And uh, someone who I think offers a degree of skepticism on certain things is Peter Schiff who is, uh, uh, well, he's a chief investment global strategist. He's an expert on so many different things related to finance and economics. Uh, and he's also kind of the Echelon Wealth Partners in Canada. Delighted to be actually uh, speaking with him. We've had some notable names, uh, but Peter, I'm sure, is going to provide us some uh, provocative thoughts uh, about what's happening with the US election, particularly economics and much more. So do stick around for the conversation. But Peter, thank you very much for joining the show. Oh, uh, thanks oh. for inviting me on. Yeah, yeah, no, it's been a, a, in the planning for a while. But um, as I have done with some other guests, I like to warm up with a lighter, heart, a lighter hearted question. But in this case, I want to jump straight in at the deep end, which is the past month, I think, has been for no other better word, but insane uh, for the US economic and should we say electoral outlook. Um, and I just wanted to really have your immediate reactions to what you see going on. Um, with the Trump campaign, with Harris, uh, and what you think that that is doing to the to the U.S. economy, and anything else you think uh, of, of relevance at the moment. Well, I, I don't think it's had much impact on the economy, uh, one way or the other. But you know, politically, I think that Trump was very well positioned to beat Biden, and mm -hmm. I still think he could beat Harris, although. You know, the polls have now flipped. He had a strong lead uh, following the debate with Biden. And that's now uh, reversed. I think the media in the U.S., which is extremely biased, has had a coordinated uh, campaign to redefine Harris and, and get behind Harris uh, and sell Harris to the American public just the way they tried to sell Biden. You know, I think the media was covering up the fact that uh, Biden was having uh, these mental issues. And once it was obvious that that wasn't the case because they had the debate and the public could see what the media and the Democrats were, were covering up, they quickly changed course. They dumped Biden. And now they're trying to repackage and sell uh, Harris. But, you know, these are the same people that were insisting that Biden was as sharp as attack. And now they're they're saying that, you know, uh, Harris is great. You know, she's brilliant. She's the best vice president and, and, and all this. Uh, but the reality is she's a very radical left uh, leaning um, person. She was raised by a, a admitted communist, her father. Uh, so it's hard to believe that the apple fell far from the tree. And I think it's very revealing in that she selected a bird of a feather uh, as uh, the vice president, the governor of Minnesota, who is also very hard left. Uh, and mm. so that would, you know, would certainly be a move in the wrong direction. I think a Harris presidency would be even worse than a Biden presidency, uh, both for, for the, certainly for the economy, but probably for the markets as well. But to just to play devil's advocate, though, um, I read in the Financial Times yesterday uh, and there was a graphic illustrating that a lot of American voters, I guess you can question the, the data pool, or the size of the pool. But um, there was a sort of suggestion that 
the American electorate might actually have more trust with Harris as president over the economy, even more than Biden uh, and, and possibly Trump. Um, in the past month, it's difficult to fully ascertain data given the short time frame. But you you disagree with that notion, and what American voters don't fully understand why well, she would be worse, or you know. Well, American voters, by and large, know the economy is in bad shape, uh, and and so that's why it was very hard for Biden to win re-election because nobody would want four more years, and and Trump was promising to to change things. Now, Biden, I mean, Harris, rather, seems to be running out a platform of change, too. When you hear her speak, she just talks about all the things that she's going to do, which, you know, why aren't they doing them? I mean, she's she's there. Um, but I think that it's it's easier for Harris to say, vote for me and things will get better because I'm going to change things than it would have mm -hmm. been for Biden, because it's obvious that there's no change if we stay the course and and reelect Biden. But, you know, when, when she initially introduced her vice presidential pick, she talked about his football career and how he took over a losing team and turned it around uh, as if that meant he was a good man for the job. But that, you know, is kind of ironic because she's admitting that the situation is bad and it needs to be turned around when she's supposed to be arguing for a continuation of the status quo, because that's what she represents. She's part of the uh, Biden-Harris administration. She's going to actually try to distance herself from Biden. And Trump is going to try to close that gap by talking about Biden-Harris, Biden-Harris, Biden-Harris to keep the Biden albatross around Harris's neck. And Harris wants to try to say, no, I'm my own woman. I'm not Biden. I'm going to do things different. And she may, she may do things even worse. So there's there's no chance that things are going to get better if uh, the country, uh, you know, elects Biden. But I mean, Harris, uh, but 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 they they absolutely will get worse. Well, I think it's indicative of the fact that you uh, unintentionally are using Biden instead of Harris sort of shows <laughs> that it's going to happen. Right. Um, but one thing just to, again, play devil's advocate with a slight other point you mentioned, which is you consider Harris to be very left now and i think the european political spectrum should be seen more i don't know center left probably moderate but even on some of the policies that you would consider democrats to be i mean she's not bernie saunders right she seems to be softer or more harder on israel in gaza for example but she seems to be you know pro may much supporting ukraine uh, does, she does seem to be more of a conventional moderate democrat but you do, you don't see it like that you no see her i mean good. she doesn't i mean they're trying to you know re redefine her that way Mm -hmm. But but her positions are are pretty left. I mean, I, I, I've read that when she was in the Senate, she was actually rated to the left of Bernie Sanders, if you can imagine, you know, imagine wow. that. So, yeah, I mean, she's you know, she's a socialist, just like a lot of um, uh, Democrats are. Um, but, yeah, you're right. I mean, socialism is very popular in Europe as well. And that's it's why there are so many problems in Europe. It's because there, there's so much government there. Uh, but, you know, Trump, Trump is not like far to the right. If you want to define that as being, you know, real free market, libertarian, small government. Trump is, you know, more towards the center. <laughs> he's, you know, he's he's not, you know, promising anything in the way of uh, reduction in government spending. Maybe that conversation with Elon Musk the other day, uh, maybe that will influence him because Musk was certainly advocating for less government, even though he's admitted that he's been a Democrat most of his life. Yet he understands the problem is too much government and we need to cut government spending. Now, he talked about, you know, trying to make government more efficient. That's impossible. Government can never be efficient. <laughs> That's why you want to keep government small. So it's not just about, uh, you know, trying to get rid of the waste, fraud and abuse. Uh, we have to get rid of a lot of government. I mean, they talked about Malay during that uh, ex uh, um, uh, 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 spaces. And yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, we need a Malay in the United States, but that means getting rid of a lot of government departments and agencies, including the Space Force, which President Trump just created. That's an agency I would abolish. We, we, you know, we can't afford it and we don't need it. Uh, but there are a lot of things that we want to get rid of. I mean, Trump talks about getting rid of the Department of Education. We should. But he then talks about transferring the money that we're spending back to the states. We don't want to transfer anything. We don't have any money. We have to borrow that money. So we want to eliminate the Department of Education so we don't have to spend the money on it anymore. 
Uh, you know, that, that's what we need to do. Yeah, I mean, uh, administrative restructuring, if you want, of the U.S. Um, political system is, is, is something to consider. But um, more specifically, I want to ask you a bit about Trump's foreign policy a little bit or how it would influence the U.S. economy, right? Because he, he uh, largely wants to be a, an isolationist, although I think he's backtracked a little bit and is more focusing on protectionist policies. Do you not think that that's a very risky move? I understand you want to put America first and focus on domestic industries and, and production and so on. That's perfectly understandable. But it's if you go too far more to try and become almost like an autarkic uh, state, you know, a North Korea version, right? Isn't that a bit unrealistic and also detrimental? Uh, or you think some degree of internalization is, is, is needed? Well, it's not so much an isolationist. It's just not being as involved overseas. I mean, not isolating us from the rest of the world, but not policing the rest of the world either, kind of uh, mm -hmm. being more neutral. Uh, that would certainly help reduce the defense budget, but he's not talking about cutting the defense budget. <laughs> you know, he didn't cut the defense budget. He increased defense spending when he was president. I mean, the main reason for disengaging would be that we can't afford it. Now, Trump talks about, well, you know, we should make the Europeans or the Japanese pay for our, our presence there, which I would agree with. I mean, if we're going to be there, they should cover the cost because I don't think we need to be there. But, you know, one of the reasons that the dollar is the reserve currency in part is because, you know, we're fulfilling this role. Maybe if we you know, uh, backtrack from that role, that's yet, a, yet another reason to get rid of the dollar, because even though we're not getting paid to have our troops there directly, we are indirectly benefiting from the subsidy that the world gives the United States by stockpiling U.S. dollars and U.S. treasuries. That's what enables our trillion dollar plus trade deficits. And I know Trump talks, you know, or at least he did before he was elected the first time. You know, part of his campaign for the 2016 uh, uh, cycle was that he wanted to get rid of the trade deficit, that the trade deficit was a big problem. And he was right. It was a big problem. Uh, but the best way to get rid of it is deregulation and lower taxes in the United States, not erecting uh, tariffs. Uh, but during his presidency, the trade deficit got worse, not better, even before COVID. But by time COVID hit, the trade deficits hit all time record highs. And then they hit even worse record highs under Biden. So, you know, that, that's a huge subsidy that the U.S. Is, is getting from the world because we, we have no ability to produce the goods that we're importing and we don't have any ability to pay for those goods either. So we just print money. But the reason the money that we're printing doesn't crash in value is because the world is willing to hold it and then loan it back to us by buying our treasuries or other uh, assets uh, rather than trying to spend them on products that we don't make and that we can't export. So what about your thoughts on, um, actually, I'll, I'll, that's, uh, I'll follow that up after this one, which is that um, I think you rightly recognize um, more than other people do that, you know, a lot of the policies that Biden has dealt with, like inflation, that Trump has some role in the, the inflation that we've seen, right? And, and I don't think a lot of people consider that you don't just have sort of a, a, a totally new economy starting from a new president, right? It, it's There's a lot of carryover. Um, some of Trump's successes were based on, I think, policies that the Obama administration had, had initiated, right? Um, there's, yeah. a, there's a lack I mean, of effect. So, yeah, just, go ahead. just because the official inflation numbers didn't spike up mm. until Biden uh, showed up doesn't mean that the origin of that uh, didn't start with Trump. In fact, it started before Trump. But Trump contributed to the inflation problem rather substantially. When Trump was president, uh, he increased government spending, both pre and post COVID, and cut taxes. And as a result, deficits went up. Uh, Donald Trump still holds the record for the biggest deficit for a single term for a president. Now, I think Biden is on track to shatter that record, but Trump still had the record. You know, now by, uh, Obama did more deficit spending than Trump, but Obama had eight years. <laughs> Trump only had four. And, and, and so the, the inflation, as Elon Musk even pointed out again, it, it, it is the difference between what the government collects in taxes and what it spends, the deficit. That's mm -hmm. what causes the inflation. Because we don't get government for free. Government must be paid for one way or the other. 
And if the government doesn't take our money through taxes to cover the spending, then it prints money to cover the spending. But that doesn't mean the spending costs us nothing. When the government has to print money and spend it, it, the, the, it causes all of the money that's out there to lose value. And so all of your savings, all of your wages lose value as a result of the new money that's been added into circulation. And prices have to rise uh, accordingly to offset that because prices have to reflect the demand and supply of goods. And when you run deficits, you don't increase the supply of goods. The goods are still the same. So now you have more money to buy those goods. The only way to clear the market is if the prices go up. And so that's what happens. And so we pay for government through higher prices instead of higher taxes. And so uh, Donald Trump, under his presidency, we got a much bigger government and we're paying for it with higher prices. Now, when Biden took over, he just made the situation even worse. Uh, uh, you know, whether Trump would have added uh, to the problem to that degree, you know, we don't know. Probably not. Uh, but uh, there is no indication that he would have become fiscally responsible in his second term. But he may not have been as irresponsible as Biden. Right. Uh, it's hard to say the counterfactual. Uh, but, you know, from a political point of view, it, it seems like it's easy for Trump to say, hey, when I was president, there was no inflation. And now there's high inflation under Biden. So get rid of Biden and put me back in and the inflation is going to come right back down. It won't. Inflation is going to get worse, regardless of the outcome of this election. I just think that it will get even worse if the nation goes with Harris uh, than Trump. So, OK, let's bring in a little bit of the geopolitics then. Because uh, I remember early last year when I first started this show, um, if anyone watching remembers that, uh, we talked about reshoring or friendshoring, right? And this idea that the Biden administration is really trying to squeeze China. Uh, I think the strategic competition here is, is something that we can also see a lot of carryover from the Trump administration with the initial trade wars. And now this, what some analysts call uh, high, high yard low. High fence, um, small, small yard strategy. I forget the uh, the initial, the exact approach. Right. Um, what What's your thoughts about this? Is this a a good strategy to try to improve America's uh, economic and financial footing vis a vis its you know main rival? Um, could friendshoring have a, a benefit? Uh, is it realistic to support American industries and interests? You know, well, near abroad. I mean, first of all, if the goal of the trade war was to reduce the trade deficit with China, we lost because our mm. trade deficits are at record highs with China. Uh, we have bigger deficits now than before Trump declared war. So we've lost the war. Uh, but, you know, there really is no winner in a trade war. Everybody loses, which is why there's no point in, in fighting one. But, you know, I would much rather see across the board tariffs on everything, not uh, just on one country, because that really doesn't even raise much revenue, because what happens is instead of importing stuff from China, we import it from Vietnam at a higher price. So the government doesn't collect the revenue, but Americans pay the higher prices. But that's another thing that, that Trump uh, gets wrong, is that when the U.S. government imposes a tariff, the tax doesn't fall on China. The tax falls on Americans who buy Chinese products or who buy other products that are more expensive than the Chinese products that they would have bought, but for the tariff. So the U.S. government can only tax Americans. Uh, it doesn't tax the Chinese. Uh, just because it puts the, the tariff on a Chinese product, that's only if an American buys it. It doesn't affect the Chinese buying those products or Europeans or anybody else, right? It's so the Americans pay the tax. But I would rather the government raise taxes through tariffs than through an income tax. In fact, ironically, the very reason that we have an income tax, the reason that the 16th Amendment got passed and the reason that the public was willing to accept an income tax was that the government promised that if we had an income tax, we could get rid of the tariffs. The income tax was supposed to fall on the very rich, the Rockefellers, the Carnegies, right? Those guys, the, the, the billionaire uh, of their time. And if we had the income tax, the public was told we can eliminate the tariffs, right? And everybody knew back then that tariffs were taxes on the middle class and the poor. Uh, and, but I think tariffs are better than an income tax because an income tax is very economically destructive. 
uh, and it costs a fortune to administer. And all of that is, is a complete economic loss. So it's much better to tax people on what they spend than on what they earn. And so tariffs do that. But I also think that U.S. manufacturing uh, you know, is, is uncompetitive. And it would help some to protect it from foreign competition for a while while it retools. But that would be contingent on deregulation uh, that would allow American manufacturers to regain the competitiveness that they lost. You know, it's not an accident that so much of this uh, production moved offshore. It's, you know, we regulated and taxes, taxed our companies uh, to make them uncompetitive. So maybe we could eliminate the corporate income tax. We could get rid of a lot of these labor laws that run up the cost of employing people in America uh, and other regulations that unnecessarily add to uh, domestic production costs that result in people buying products overseas because they're cheaper, right? Uh, and so uh, that may take a little time so the tariffs could help, but they, again, they need to be across the board evenly uh, you know, on all products, not just selective products, just like, hey, we're going to have a duty on these products and then use that revenue to replace the income tax. But I mean, or at least a chunk of the income tax. I mean, a lot, a lot of the income tax, I, I don't want the revenue replaced. I just I just don't want the government to take that money from the private sector. I'd rather have the government leave it there. But that means we need substantial cuts in government spending, like, you know, what you're talking about in Argentina, which is what we need. We need to dismantle. Mm much of the U.S. federal government. And we also need to make substantial cuts to entitlement, something that Donald Trump has said is off the table. But it, it actually has to be on the table. It's important that those cuts be on the table because there's no way to solve the problems unless we, we cut that spending. So I'm going to ask you a radical question then, because I know it's going to make some of your viewers or people watching go uh, insane. But what about the idea of not an income tax, but a wealth tax? Because I remember in the... 2020 election, Warren, I think, who you all consider an absolute hard left, but she she posed this idea of a wealth tax that, you know, you'd levy, I think it was 2% on households with a net worth over 50 million and 3% on over 1 billion. Um, but it wouldn't dissuade people. Their argument was from saving and investing. Obviously, that's not something that's going to happen in the United States. But is that concept a little bit more because of the money generated from those wealth classes would be insane and you could pay off so much debt and deal with so many yeah. issues well issues. what's your thought first of all yeah and an, un an unapportioned wealth tax would, would would clearly be unconstitutional i mean at least hopefully the court would would, would strike it down uh as as unconstitutional so hopefully it's a non-starter but even if the constitution didn't prohibit it it's not a good idea it's it's an even worse tax than an income tax because at mm -hmm. least when there's an income tax in theory, there's income to pay the tax. But when you just tax wealth, the wealth itself doesn't necessarily generate any income from which the tax could be paid. And so you may have to liquidate the wealth. You may have to sell it. Mm -hmm. and, and also, when, when somebody earns income, okay, you know, here's what they earn. But in order to know what your assets are worth, in many cases, they need to be appraised. Right? You don't know. I mean, sure, if it's a publicly traded stock, you don't need an appraisal because there's a market. But when you're, when you're talking about real estate, when you're talking about, you know, art, uh, you know, collectible cars or baseball cards or whatever people have, I mean, you don't know exactly what it's worth. Uh, you could try to estimate it, but you'd have to constantly do that. And, and that would cost a lot of money. Uh, and, and, and it would be very disruptive uh, if the big insiders of some of these companies had to constantly dump stock to pay a wealth tax. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, it, it's not the way that you want to uh, run a government. And of course, wealth is very key to capitalism. You want to have wealth because wealth is what funds investment. You know, the wealthy people don't spend their wealth, right? <laughs> they're, they're using their wealth productively. It's invested in growing the economy. So you don't want to destroy wealth that's been accumulated. You don't want to tax it and then spend it and turn it into consumption uh, because then you're, you're, you're basically killing the goose that, that, that lays the golden egg or, you know, you're eating the seed corn. Uh, so you want to leave.
capital accumulate. That's why one of the reasons I hate the estate tax, inheritance tax. You don't want to destroy wealth just because the person who earned it died. You want to allow that wealth to go down through the generations where it can be used to grow the economy. You know, I mean, I'm fine with taxing wealthy people when they buy things. Right. So if you want to tax somebody when when they buy a private jet or when they buy a yacht or whatever they do, sure, put a tax on that. But when somebody earns money and doesn't spend it, the last thing you'd want to do is tax that because they're not using that money just to enjoy their own lives. They're using it for the benefit of everybody else, you know, because they're investing it productively. They're, you know, creating goods and services. They're providing employment opportunities. Why would you want to diminish that? Because that's what happens. You know, when you raise taxes on the rich, they don't stop spending. They stop investing. They stop saving. You get less of that. They're not going to spend less, you know, mm. because they, they, their, their taxes go up, but they will save and invest less. Uh, so you don't you don't want to do, uh, you don't want to do that. That's why a national sales tax or value added tax is a much better effective way of taxing the rich uh, than going after their earnings uh, because those earnings could be, you know, very important to economic growth. I'm inclined to agree on, on much of that. So I would be amiss uh, and, and, and frankly, uh, I think my audience would be very disappointed if I didn't uh, trigger you with the good old crypto. So um, I'm very curious for your thoughts about um, Harris's visits or the, this sort of um, both campaigns seem to have been building a bit of a sort of, uh, I don't know, trying to approach the, the crypto communities yeah. as a way yeah. to sort of engage them, right? W what is going on here? Um, what well, are your thoughts and, and why are they doing it? Like, Well, first please. of all, you know, a wealth tax would really destroy uh, Bitcoin. Could you, can you imagine the people that are hodling all this Bitcoin that they got for nothing, the whales, and they're sitting on these huge <laughs> gains if they actually had to pay a tax on those gains? They, they'd have to sell so much Bitcoin that the price would crash. <laughs> and so they, the gains would go away just by trying to uh, sell enough to, to, pay, to pay the tax. But yeah. I think what's going on with crypto now from the political landscape is I think Donald Trump and some of the Republicans are trying to curry favor with the crypto community, both for their campaign donations and their votes. And if you look at a lot of the rhetoric that is associated with Bitcoin, a lot of it is uh, limited government, uh, anti-fiat currency, hard money. They focus on inflation and dollar debasement. So the philosophical core of, uh, of Bitcoin is already leaning Republican anyway, Republican libertarian. Uh, and, and so it's a natural part of the base that they want to energize. Uh, but there's also maybe some moderates or probably some Democrats out there that, that you know, own Bitcoin. And for them, it could be a single issue, um, you know, a, a thing if, uh, you know, they're just thinking about, you know, what's in it for them, because the, the politicians now are promising to go into the market and buy Bitcoin, right? I mean, you have uh, Loomer, uh, Loomis, or whatever her name is, out in Wyoming, has the Bitcoin reserve bill that she's introduced uh, about buying, the U.S. government buying 5% uh, of all the Bitcoin, you know, a million Bitcoin. And if they were to do that, I mean, they could push the price way up and that would benefit the people who already own Bitcoin because they can sell their Bitcoin to the U.S. government, uh, you know, or, you know, and, and, and make money. And, and so it's really like a bribe that's being offered. But I guess it's no different than bribing students by saying or not or former students by saying we're going to forgive your student loans. Vote for me and I'll make and, I, and you won't have to repay your student loans. Right. I mean, that's the inherent flaw with democracy. That's why it's a very dangerous way to run a country, because people will vote for stuff like that. You know, you can bribe the electorate, you know, vote for me and I'll give you this. But whatever the government gives to one person has to be stolen from somebody else. Right. There's no free lunch. Um, and uh, and so, you know, if the U.S. taxpayer is going to be taxed to buy Bitcoin, then, it's you know, that's where the money is going to come from. Uh, in order to do it, just like, you know, it, somebody's got to pay the cost of the student loans that are not repaid. They're, you know, they're, it's always that you have to rob from Peter to pay Paul. 
And when you do that, you can always count on Paul's vote, right? That's, but, but what the, the key is that they try to prevent Peter from realizing he's being robbed so they could, they could get his vote too, right? That's why they love inflation because they don't actually have to take any money from anybody. They just take purchasing power from everybody, but then they blame it on, on other factors. And sometimes the government gets lucky because free market capitalism causes prices to fall. That's the natural tendency of prices is to go down. The government could take advantage of that by creating inflation so that prices don't go down. They stay the same or they go up a little bit. And so you don't notice the gain that you missed out on. But if the government wasn't causing all this inflation, the cost of living for everybody would be much lower. And so everybody's standard of living would be much higher.